Welcome back. So, literacy where... Yes, what I was saying essentially is this. The Civil Aviation Act clearly redefined the role of the minister and the DGC. Took away policy, uh, the regulatory powers to NCA, left policy formulation with the minister responsible for aviation. In fact, it said clearly that in formulating those policies, the minister must ensure that those policies do not conflict with the powers of the DGNC to make regulations. What I'm saying essentially is it's a process. Yeah, Captain said it. Agreed. NCA is the, is, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, oversight authority. It feels the pulse of the industry. So NCA should come up with uh, ideas. The, the, the initiation should start within the NCA. And I think to a large extent, that is some of the rules economic regulations uh, directorate of NCA is playing. So um, just to say that while I agree that the, the, the operating environment in terms of infrastructure to enable you know, uh, a sustained flight operation is lacking, like she rightly said, you go to Europe, in, U in the Americas, you fly up to uh, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. domestic within a country because the infrastructures are there to support night flights. If we had infrastructures at our airports, I can assure you our operators would take the largest chunk of passengers who are going by road with the right p package, products, because at night, the operating hours is, is reduced because of traffic is less. So you, you, you save fuel and all those stuff. And I think it would be better for our industry. Okay, let me go to Tui. Um, we've talked about hostile operating environment, unfriendly policies, exploitative taxation. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the airlines have been run by... Um, people who have the managerial skills to do that or is it the owner manager syndrome thing well it, it's it's a mix it's a mix actually you have some airlines that um, have good um, managerial setting they have a very good foundation they have um, knowledgeable technical people in the hands of the affair running the airline and then you also have some airlines that um, they started well and then along the line you have maybe the owner syndrome setting in and if you actually look at what is happening in the industry you might to some extent maybe not really really blame some of the owners simply because when you look at your investment going down maybe that I'm just saying maybe that is why some of them you know get involved in it to see how they can at least recover some of their money. But it would also mean, for instance, that if, for instance, the owner didn't, was not part of the managerial skill from the beginning, just, mm. okay, I have this funds, I want to do this, and then appoint somebody who is, you know, knows his onions, there wouldn't be problems, I think. No, there will still be problems because, you see, it's one thing for you to want to do the right thing. It's another for you to have the environment to be able to do it. You have the right people in place, you have your investment, you have the aircraft, you have skilled personnel, you have the money, you have the, your AMO, everything you need to operate effectively. But then the environment is not helping you. But we all know about the environment, so if we are proactive, would things like this happen? It's not just about, you see, it's not just about being, you can be proactive, but then when you get into the real situation, you just can help it. I'll give you an example. Let me just take fuel. Um, early last year, we were buying fuel at about 808 per liter. And even at that time, we were selling maybe the minimum ticket was like 19,000 naira. Today, we are buying fuel, 240 naira per liter in Lagos. There was a time we were buying at 260 per liter in Lagos. And you're still selling a ticket of 19,000 naira because if you sell maybe at 25,000 you'll be struggling to fill your aircraft 
Are you guys still selling tickets for 19,000? There are tickets. As of last week, there's some operators that were even selling tickets at 15,000 naira. Really? There was something that happened sometimes two weeks ago. I did just a practical example, you know, just to see an analysis of a flight. The flight wasn't selling simply because, and we were, the fare was at 30,000 naira. It wasn't selling. And then I said to my people, I said, look, this flight is not selling. And then we can't go tomorrow with just less than 35 passengers on a 136 um, aircraft. It, it wouldn't even buy the fuel. I said, okay, let's just see what we can do to at least fuel this airplane. And then drop the fares. We dropped the fare to 25,000. And then we, within two or three hours, we had like additional five people. They bought the ticket. This was a ticket that has been, I mean, a, a flight that has been stagnant for like almost the whole day. And then we dropped further to 19, no, to 21,000. And we had almost additional 30 people buying the ticket. What does that tell you? People want to buy, but then they don't even have, they can afford to spend maybe 30,000 naira or 35,000 naira just to go from Lagos to Abuja. But that doesn't even cover your operating cost per seat. Okay, well, let me, let me bring this in here. Maybe you also weigh in as we wind up. How do we move forward? Um, Abiyotun Ajibade says, not all, the airlines are not operating in full capacity. Says, imagine an airline surviving on just one or two flights daily. How can such an airline meet its financial obligations? Agreed on the part of the operatives of these airlines. They want to recoup their investment in the shortest possible time. So a journey of one hour costs about 30,000, 30, mm -hmm. whereas you can do a journey of about 12 hours in the, on international flights for about 150,000 as in equivalent. So for 12 hours, you pay 150,000 equivalent, but here you pay 30,000 now for one hour. So by this exorbitant cost, many potential passengers go away and they then a 150-seater plane just goes with about 30 passengers. And it says, personal conduct is also a point. I was told that economy class was fully booked. I had to go for business class only to board and see a lot of empty seats in the economy. I was really pissed off. So see how the operators also seem to be pushing their customers away? How can that happen? Listen, um, there, there are several factors, really. Uh, we, we cannot take, I mean, I've mentioned a few, uh, which I, I think are fundamental. I mean, these other issues are issues that will come on top of the, the fundamental issue. My take will be, if we address the fundamental issues, uh, all these ancillary issues will come on top and can be dealt with as we move forward. The important thing is that the main structure of the industry, the foundation of the industry, has to be sound. It's only on a sound foundation that you can build. If you start talking about the ancillary issues without talking about the fundamentals, we still wouldn't get anywhere. So the point is, we must grapple with the major issues in the industry. You, we're talking about, you talked about the exploitative taxes. Uh, last week in, a, in the program in Abuja, the, the DGNCA was there. And I made the point that part of a problem in the, in the industry is the overtaxation in the industry. And that is simply because it is such a structured industry that it's so easy to tax. We have a 5% VAT on an airline ticket. The only place in the world I know does that. Uh, we, we have a 5% uh, tax payable to the CAA. Now, that same 5% tax is the revenue by which the NCA actually should operate. But it shares that revenue with NAMA, NIMET, and INCAT. Now, my point is, NAMA still charges airlines you know, for uh, overflight charges, flight plan, and the rest of it. So what happens to the money shared from the 5%? So the point is, airlines are made to pay 5% to the CAA, shared amongst all these agencies. At the same time, they still pay to the service providers. So you're looking at a situation where all these taxes, they, are, they end up being something. I mean, she talked about the issue of fuel. Fuel is about 45 to 60% of your major operating cost component. And at 100% escalation, when you have not even increased your yield, is a major dysfunction. And you know, no matter how you look at it, add on everything, it's gonna be very difficult for any airline to survive this environment. Most of the things we struggle to put in place in Nigeria are taken for granted in other climes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get to the airport, you have a counter to check in. 
everything is there in Europe, in America, in Nigeria. You get the power base, you bring in your system, you have a, a UPS, everything just to make sure that you can, you can function. So to a large extent, it's very difficult in the environment to find ourselves and you want to do it right. How do you do it? It will okay. cost you. It was real quick, we have to go. Well, uh, forward. well for me, uh, it's a system problem. With both within the airline system and the environment, while I my take on this is that if you look at the niche operators, they are doing well in this industry. There is a tendency for an airline to come in, open up new routes when there's no proper. Uh, uh, route study and uh, uh, economics of it. So you fly on a route with uh, a, a, an aircraft that is 120 capacity with 30 passengers on board. You cannot make profit. Okay. Thank you very much. We're speaking with Captain Roland Iyai, MD Top Brass Aviation, Ahmad Litrius, President, Air Transport Senior Staff Services Association of Nigeria, and Tony Olajide, Chief Operating Officer, Air Peace. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts with us. Okay. Let's hope that our environment, aviation environment, will get a lot better. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank